As we launch into this message today, I wanna to start with a question. And so I wanna ask, would you please engage your mind and be a little bit reflective right now? The question that I wanna ask you is do you ever feel incredibly frustrated by your own inability to change? Like there's some area of your life where you feel discouraged, disappointed, you don't want to be that way anymore, but you just keep ending back up in that pattern. Maybe you've told yourself a hundred times, I'm gonna quit smoking, or I'm gonna get in shape, I'm gonna go to the gym, I'm gonna eat healthy, I'm gonna drink more water, sleep more, I'm gonna stop cussing, I'm gonna stop yelling at my kids, I'm gonna be more patient. I've got all these different things inside of us that we want to change and do better, but we just can't seem to get there. We depend a lot on willpower to change, don't we? Like if I can just get motivated enough intrinsically, if I could get a good plan together, I can work my plan. But I wonder how many of you would be honest enough to say that willpower, it just ain't cutting it, right? Like it's not enough. And so we end up frustrated with our own inability to change. But did you know that there is so much research these days that is showing us that change is a team sport? Change is not something that we can just approach individualistically, which might be where we go wrong because we are such individualistic kind of people. Even globally, in cultures where they're more community-based, more tribal, there is this rising sense of individualism. And we tend to think that we are much more self-sufficient than we actually are. I wanna share with you a bit of research I came across as I was preparing for this message. There was a study done in um, the United States Air Force Academy that followed a group of cadets from the time they were freshmen all the way through their senior year. Now, when cadets enter the U.S. Air Force Academy, they're placed into groups called squadrons. There's about 30 or so cadets in a squadron, and they're all pretty similar. They're just randomly selected, they get put there, but these squadrons become very close, like family groups, because they do everything together. They eat together, sleep together, they work out together, study together, everything. But what they were noticing is that some squadrons when it came to physical fitness, really excelled at physical fitness and they had great gains, they showed a lot of improvement, while other squadrons did not. And they were wondering why, like they're basically living the same lifestyle, why are some improving and others are not? Well, this research revealed that the determining factor was the least fit person in the squadron. And if that person was highly motivated, and if they were like wanting to get more fit, then the whole squadron would kind of rally around them and the, this squadron would see great gains. But conversely, if that least fit person was like unmotivated, kind of critical, maybe apathetic when it came to physical fitness, it was contagious to the whole group. It would, and so that, that squadron would not see the same kind of gains physically as another squadron would. I wanna to read to you a quote from the guy that wrote this article. His name is Brad Solberg. And he says, so much focus on behavior change and performance focuses on the individual. Yet that's only half of the story. Working to build a better self almost always means working to build a better community or tribe with which you surround it. This concept holds true whether you're trying to get better at running, painting, writing, making music, parenting, or coaching. And for our context, I might add in there, or growing in Christ-like character. It also holds true if you're trying to quit smoking, adhere to a healthier way of eating, or start a new exercise program. It's true if you're a beginner, or if you're on the verge of becoming world-class. In other words, listen to this, the people with whom you surround yourself have an enormous impact on your life. In many ways, they shape it. Those are some really strong words. You might be familiar with the very popular quote that says that you are the average of the five people that are closest to you. I think I first heard that quote when I was a stay-at-home mom homeschooling my three little kids, and I was like, Oh, that makes sense. 
I, I am the average of the five people I spend the most time with. That explains a lot about the way I'm feeling right now. And it's true that those people have a huge impact on us, but it's not just those people that are closest to us. We're also heavily influenced by other sources as well. You're influenced by people that you interact with casually at work. If, they are, if they're critical, it's rubbing off on, on you too. We're influenced by the communities that we live in, social norms. We're influenced by what's going on in the media and in social media. We're, there are all kinds of influences that are having an effect on us, the tribe around us. And, and so the, if you are feeling a little bit frustrated by your own inability to change, might I suggest that it could be that we're approaching it the wrong way, we're thinking that we can go at it alone when actually the tribe around us is shaping our trajectory. Our tribe shapes our trajectory. If you want to get to a certain place in your life, if you have some goals, if you have some things about yourself that you want to grow, that tribe around you, it's shaping the direction of your life. And you know, this is not new information, right? This is something that our moms started teaching us when we were 12 years old, to say, hey, your friends are having a big influence on you. So you gotta choose your friends wisely. I know your mama taught you, my mama taught me, and I am sure trying to teach my kids that truth. But if you go back even further than that, 3,000 years ago, King Solomon told us this when he said that he who walks with the wise will grow wise but a companion of fools suffers harm. So all of this scientific data and this research that sounds so smart, it's really only serving to support what Solomon told us 3,000 years ago, that if we want to become more wise, if we want to grow, then we need to surround ourselves with people that are like-minded. Another way of saying this is that what is in other people can get on you. What's in them can get on you. So you, you've experienced this before. If you interact with someone and they're really gossipy, they've just got that gossip inside of them, man, that gets on you. And maybe later you notice that you're talking about people in a way that's not honorable and you're like, what, what happened? Well, what was in them got on you. And we have to be careful because what gets on us can then get in us. And so if, if you are interacting with a person that's very negative, and, and everything in life has this negative point of view. That, that can get on us. If you, it, it's true if someone is deceptive. It's true if someone's positive. It happens both directions, for good or for bad. What is in a person can get on us when we interact with them. And that's why it's so important that we are thoughtful and reflective about the people that we are being influenced by. So every day we are being influenced by a thousand different sources. And, and some are people that are close to us, some are people that, we're, that we may not even know, people um, in the media. For example, different parts of a country tend to have things in common. Like we tend to have similar hobbies, uh, similar values. Certain regions of the country tend to vote in a certain direction. Whereas if you go to a different part of the country, that part of the country has different values, different hobbies, and different ways of voting. We are influenced in ways that we don't even want to admit that we're being influenced by the people that are around us. But it still holds true that the people that have the greatest influence on us are those five people that are closest to us. Because those are the people that we look to, right? That we go to when we need some counsel on something. They're the people whose opinions matter to us. They're the ones we ask advice from. And I wonder if we could just go around the room right now and and offer a time where we were given some bad advice. I bet you we would have some funny stories in this room. If we just turned to the person next to us and we shared, let me tell you about a time I got some bad advice. Like there would be funny stories, there would be really tragic stories, sad stories, people that ended up in a place they never intended to be because they got the wrong advice. I wanna tell you a story about when my son got some bad advice. My son was four years old at the time And the advice came from my other son, who was six years old at the time. And now, just so that you can kind of get a visual picture in your mind of of what it was like in those days, I wanna show you a picture of these two boys, Cademan and Sammy. 
their precious little faces, so innocent, and they got some bad advice going on between them. So every day what happened was we would do this thing called room time. And in the afternoon for one hour, the boys would have independent playtime separately. They would, Cademan would go to one place in the house, Sammy to a different place, and they would just play for an hour. Well, unbeknownst to me, those two boys had walkie talkies. And so they're in communication with each other during their independent playtime. And so Cademan comes on, the six-year-old, and he's like, Sammy, can you hear me? And Sammy's like, yeah, I can hear you. And uh, Cademan says, hey, Sammy, you should go see if Jake can come over and play. And so Sammy goes, okay. Well, Sammy is in a part of the house that had an outdoor exit. And he did not have to come by where I was to get outside of the house. Sammy got some bad advice that day. Sammy walks out the house, down the street, around the corner, across a street. My four-year-old, across a street, knocks on Jake's door. Jake's mom answers the door and Sammy says, can Jake come play? And she like looks around and she's like, um, no, Jake's not available to come play right now. And he says, okay. So he crosses the street around the corner back to my house down the street. I never knew that this happened. You guys, it happened twice. The only way that I found out that this happened was that that weekend, Jake's mom came to me at Little League and she said, hey, Stacy, I just wanted to make sure that you realized Sammy has come by our house two times this week to see if Jake could play. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Excuse me? Uh, he got some bad advice, you guys. He followed some bad advice and, and we've all been there before. And bad advice, man, that'll get you in trouble, won't it? We're gonna talk today about a story in the Bible where a guy took some wrong advice. He listened to the wrong counsel and it cost him greatly. You might be familiar with the name King Solomon. He was the third king of Israel and he was King David's son who was like, the most famous king in the world. So I'm, I know you've heard of King David. Well, Solomon, in a lot of ways, he was a great king. He did a lot for Israel. He was able to secure Israel's borders so there was peace during his reign. I'll show you a picture, um, a map. That blue region was Solomon's kingdom. And it was the largest region of land that, that Israel ever had. And so there, during Solomon's reign, there was, there was peace and prosperity in the land. The trade routes were open. There, um, they were at peace with their enemies. There were all kinds of um, gates and city walls that went up to fortify the cities. Solomon had all kinds of um, big, massive building projects that he did, not the least of which were his palace. And then there was this world-renowned temple that Solomon built. And people would come from all over the world just to see this amazing temple. So in some ways, Solomon was this amazing king. But in other ways, not quite so wise. The Bible tells us that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Can you imagine? I mean, not wise, bro, not wise. I did some math here. Solomon reigned for 40 years. So that means that Solomon averaged about 18 weddings a year. That would have been one and a half a month. How's that? I mean, he just, he really missed the mark in some ways. Now, Solomon's kingdom was about to be passed to his son because he was nearing his, um, nearing his death. And in some ways, the kingdom seemed so strong but in other ways, when you look a little bit more closely, it's not quite as strong as it looks from the outside. All of those wives that Solomon married, they worshiped other gods. And so there was a lot of moral compromise, that, that spiritual foundation of faith that Israel was, was built upon was, was diminishing, and there was moral compromise in the land. The other thing that was really hard was all of these building projects had taken its toll on the people of Israel because they were the ones that were pulling it off. And so they, they were experiencing the benefits of Solomon's reign, like there was peace, there was safety, there was prosperity, but also there was all this heaviness of labor and it was crushing them. And so as Solomon hands his kingdom to his son, 
What looks like a very strong kingdom on the outside is actually rather fragile and shaky under the surface. And that's where we're gonna pick up the story in 1 Kings chapter 12. So if you look there in verse one, it says, Rehoboam, which was Solomon's son that takes the kingdom, he went to Shechem for all of Israel had gone there to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard this, he was still in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon and he returned from Egypt. Now we're just gonna stop there for a quick second because there are two names and they're very confusing because they're weird names, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and unfortunately they rhyme, which makes it even harder to keep them separate. But we already talked about Rehoboam. He was Solomon's son. He becomes the fourth king of Israel. Now Jeroboam is not related to them at all. He's from a different tribe, but he was a great leader. The Bible calls him a man of, a man of uh, standing. And Solomon had taken note of Jeroboam when he was the king. And he saw what a great leader he was and he put him in charge of a huge labor force. Now, Jeroboam became a bit of a threat to Solomon, though, because a prophet prophesied over him that one day he would be the king over 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. So obviously Solomon doesn't like that. He tries to have Jeroboam killed. Jeroboam flees to Egypt, but now he's back. And he, he is a great leader and a great threat to Rehoboam. And so in verse three, it says, so all of Israel sent for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to this new king, Rehoboam, and said to him, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke that he put on us, and we will serve you. So Rehoboam answered them, go away for three days and then come back to me. So the people went away. Now, King Rehoboam consulted the elders. Can you just circle or underline that phrase, the elders, because that's really significant. He consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. So, so far, so good. King, King Rehoboam has gone a good track. He is presented with his first problem as king of Israel, his first major request and decision. And he knows he doesn't need to make this decision hastily. And so he says, give me a few days to think about this. And then he calls in the elders to give him some consult. He says, what do you guys think we should do? And this is the advice that they give him. They said, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. They'll always be loyal to you. Now, things start to go south in this next verse, in verse eight, where it says, but Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders, and he consulted the young men who had grown up with him. So underline, circle that phrase, the young men who had grown up with him. So basically, what Rehoboam does here is he calls his boys together. Right? He calls all his fraternity bros together and he's like, what do you guys think we should do? These are all guys that are trying to get in good with the new king, right? They're like, I want a seat at that council. And so what kind of advice do you think they're gonna give him, right? So he calls his boys together and he's like, what should, what should we do? What, what's your advice? What should I answer these people who say to me, lighten the, loke your the yoke your father put on us? Now the young men who had grown up with him are like, oh, let me tell you what you should say. These people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now, you tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So this is some really intense advice, right? It's like, over the top here. Like they show up big, we're gonna show up bigger. And you just gotta be like, Rehoboam, how do you think that's gonna go over? Like how do you think people are gonna respond to that? Is that gonna be a, a wise first decision that you make as king? In verse 12 it says, three days later Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam. As the king had said, come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice by the elders, he followed the advice of the young men and said, my father made your yoke heavy, I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips, I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen 
to the people. He listened to who he wanted to listen to. He, had, he was greatly influenced by the people that were surrounding him and it cost him greatly. In fact, it cost him the kingdom of Israel. That one decision that he made divided the kingdom of Israel. I wanna show you another map. You see the purple region is the kingdom of Israel which divided off that day because of that decision. And 10 of the tribes went with Jeroboam and they were loyal to him. Now King Rehoboam only had the southern kingdom which became the kingdom of Judah and only two of the tribes out of, uh, remained loyal to King Rehoboam and the house of David, never to be reunited again. That day, that decision, the kingdom of Israel was divided. And you just look at that and you're like, man, where did he go wrong? And it's obvious to us because we have hindsight perspective, right? Like he listened to the wrong advice. He, he had the wrong people surrounding him and it cost him greatly. And this happens to us as well. Bad advice always leads to unwanted results. In all of our lives, when we are listening to the wrong people, it takes us to places that we do not intend to go. If you want to become wise, you have to walk with the wise. If you have areas in your life where you want to grow, some goals that you want to reach, we have to surround ourselves with people that are helping pull us in that direction. Have you ever noticed that, ten, that friends tend to begin, begin to resemble one another, start to rub off on each other a little bit? And never is this more obvious than when we are in high school, right? I love high school students. Andy and I started out our ministry in student ministry. And so we have deep affection for student ministry. Even up until we moved here to Orange County, I had a group of high school girls that were my small group. And I, I love high school students because they're so fun and they're hilarious and they have the capacity to change the whole world. And so just a huge heart for student ministry. But as I was serving in student ministry, one thing that would always make me laugh were the trends that would come through and you would just notice them. And so everybody would start showing up to student ministry and for a while it was vans. Everybody was wearing vans, like any color of vans, there's all kinds of styles of vans, everybody had on vans. But then it started to be Air Force Ones. And then all those poor mamas had to go back to the store and scrounge up money because their kid was like, mama, I need some Air Force Ones. Vans are out, Air Force Ones are in. Now, it wasn't that Air Force Ones became uncool. It was just that blazers entered the scene. And then everybody needed a pair of blazers. And then somewhere along the way, we took a hard left turn. I do not think it was the right decision, but somehow we ended up with Crocs. I, I don't know how it happened. I don't know how you go from Nike to plastic shoes. But it's a thing and, it, and people like Crocs now and it, it makes me laugh because I see all these trends and my girls would come into small group and they'd all have like matching hairstyles and they'd all be eating the same food and matching sweaters and, and it would just make me smile because I do it too. I see it in myself, I see it in adults. Like you talk about gym culture, like if you go to a gym, everybody at that gym starts wearing similar things. Or if you're like a young professional in a certain professional profession, there's like a uniform, a, a, an unannounced uniform. It's just code that this is how we dress. Like if I go to London to a pastor's conference where it feels like everybody there is super cool, like I'm thinking about how is everybody there gonna be dressed? Because I don't wanna be the girl that shows up looking like I'm picking my kids up in the school pickup line, right? Like I, I want to look like my tribe. And, and we all do this, our tribe, we start to look like them, we start to value the things they value, we start to talk like our tribe. And that's why it's so important for us to get the right tribe. And so for our last few minutes today, I wanna talk about that, like how can we get the right tribe? And I wanna give you a tool that I hope you will find helpful. And this tool is called the table test. Now, in most countries where there is a leader, a president, prime minister, chancellor, whatever it is, that leader has some form of cabinet or executive council. 
And these are people that they have invited to serve them by providing counsel, advice, wisdom in specific areas. And so here we have the Secretary of the Treasury, and these are uh, the Secretary of State. You've got someone that might be Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary of the Interior, here's Secretary of Education, and Secretary of Health and Human Services. There's so many titles. There's like probably over 20 different people that serve on the President's cabinet. I don't even know what half of them do, but it sounds very important. And I'm sure they're all very smart and have a very good job. But the point is that these people have been invited because the president sees some type of value add that they can contribute to his goals, to his desired outcomes. They're helping him to make wise choices to go in the direction that he wants to go. Now, what I wanna propose to you is that we all have a table. Some of us are unaware of the table. Some of us are unintentional about the table but we all have a table, people that are surrounding us that are influencing our decisions. And so today what I'm hoping is that by the time we leave here, we could get a little bit more intentional around who is seated at our table. For example, some of us would really benefit from having a secretary of financial peace in our life, right? Like we just need some help to get back on the right track. And let me tell you, the guy at your table that you invite, you don't want it to be your friend that's $50,000 in debt giving you advice about your finances, right? You gotta be intentional about who you invite to sit at your table. Maybe most of us probably could benefit from a secretary of relational health because we all need help with our relationships. We all need help with parenting and with marriage and with our roommates. Like relationships are challenging. So you don't want to ask someone who's just spent their life going in and out of relationships, a whole string of broken relationships, to be the person that's giving you counsel on how to do relationships in your life. We need to be intentional about it. Maybe you want a spiritual director because you have some goals in your life to become that person that God has created you to be. You want to grow in your intimacy with God, that pers personal close relationship that God has for you. Why don't you find someone that has walked that journey that could help guide you on that journey? Maybe you need a recreation analyst because you work yourself to the grind. You are working 60 or 70 hours a week and you need a friend that's like, uh-uh. We are gonna have some fun. We're gonna add fun in your life. And that's important. We've got director of personal growth. You've got a physical fitness expert, which probably all of us would benefit from. But there, there are people that we can invite to sit at our table that can speak into our lives. You know, you sit down, some people are sitting down at their table and you kind of look around and you're like, wow, my table's rather empty because I don't, I haven't invited anyone in. Like I've got this Lone Ranger mentality. Like I'm just very individualistic and I, I can do it myself. I, I think I'm a self-sufficient person, but then you look around and you're like, well, it's a little lonely at my table and we have to remember that change is a team sport. And if we really are serious about growing and changing in any area of our life, then we need to invite people that we trust and admire to sit at our table. Some people have invited themselves over for dinner. <laughs> some crazy people have ended up at your table and it might be time to invite some of those people to leave. Because you know what? People at this table, they serve at the pleasure, right? That's what we say about the president's cabinet. They serve at the pleasure because the president wants them there. They are providing a benefit to the president by their wise counsel. And you may have inadvertently ended up with some people at your table that no longer need to be there because they are not helping you reach your desired outcomes. And we have to be thoughtful around who we allow to sit at our table. Now our church has a table and we call that table small groups. And because you don't just need experts and mentors and advisors in your life at your table, you also need friends. You need a community around you, people that are just trying to row in the same direction that you are, people with similar values and goals for their life, people that are trying to do family life in a way that honors God. There's power in community. There's power of we're in this thing together. And then you have people that you, you celebrate the birth of a baby with 
and people that you can go to when you need advice on a business deal or on a parenting situation that you're up against. You need people in your life that will surround you when you walk through a crisis or you hit up against some grief in your life. You know, there are Every week or very often we talk here at Saddleback about let's get in a small group. Everybody join a small group, get your community. And there are so many reasons why people don't choose to do that. You know, we're, we're very busy. Our lives, we have a lot of different things pulling at us, a lot of different priorities. Some of you may be more introverted. Some of you might just not feel the need for that in your life. But let me tell you when you're gonna wish you had a small group a tribe that surrounds you. It's when you go through a crisis. Let me tell you the story of a precious couple in our church named Betty and Greg Hopkins. Betty and Greg were deeply invested in the same small group for 17 years. And they, are, they not only have done Bible studies with this group, but they do all kinds of fun stuff too. They share meals together, and they, they will go on trips together, camping trips, fishing trips. They've even served internationally on mission trips together. And so these people are deeply connected with one another. They've got some miles under them, and they, they, are, they know each other's families and their situations. Well, one day, a few months ago, Greg got up early one morning to go fishing, as was a, a tradition for him. But that day, Greg never made it out the door. And a couple hours later, when Betty woke up, she found him there, and he was already gone. And before Betty even thought to dial 911, she thought to call her small group, because these were people that she knew would rally around her. So she calls someone from her small group who then called everyone else in her small group and about the same time that the paramedics and the police were arriving, also her small group was showing up one couple after another couple after another couple. And they said, Betty, we're not gonna let you walk through this alone. We are your family. We will surround you right now. We're gonna help you make every difficult decision that you don't know how to make. We're not gonna let you be alone in this. Actually, Betty went and lived with a member of her small group for the next three weeks, and they fed her, and they reminded her to take a shower and to get out of bed every day. And they said, Betty, we are in this with you. We are your family. That's the power of having a tribe. And that's what we want for each of you. Not that you would have to go through a crisis like that, but on the day when crisis inevitably knocks at your door, that you would have a tribe that surrounds you. People that know you and that you know them. People that want to show up for you in those moments. That's the body of Christ. That's how God designed life to work, that we would have relationships with one another. And sometimes I need to draw from your strength and sometimes you need to draw from mine. Because when we're in relationship with one another, I'm strengthened by your strength and I'm held accountable by your love and your concern for me. And I'm motivated to be the best person I can be because I know my life is having an impact on yours. That's how God designed life to work. We were never designed to be independent. Andy and I are not raising our teenage sons to be independent. We want them to be interdependent because we were made for one another. We were made for community, for supporting one another through a tribe. We all have areas in our life where we want to grow Areas where we're not satisfied, where we feel discouraged and defeated because there are things that we want to change about ourselves. But we need to remember that change is a team sport and the people that we surround ourselves with are having an enormous influence on our life. So as we conclude today's service, I just wanna walk us through a few moments of reflection, a reflective exercise. I wanna ask you three questions. And maybe you would just open your heart to the Lord right now and say, Holy Spirit, would you speak to me directly about my tribe, the people that are at my table? Because I wanna hear from you. The first question is this, who is currently seated at my table? 
And maybe right there in the margins, you would write down some actual names of people. And can we just be honest here? Like write down the names of the people who are actually already seated at your table. Maybe you've got some great people that surround you. Maybe you've got some really sketchy characters that are attached to you too. And that's okay. But the important thing is that you would just be honest about who's at your table so that you can reflect on how those people are influencing your life. So who's currently seated at your table? And then the second question is, who do I need to invite to join? Who do I need to invite to join me? What, what are the areas of my life where God's saying, I want you to grow in that area? Maybe it's parenting. And maybe you're, you need to get some people around you whose parenting methods and models have been effective. And you can invite them closer into your life. Maybe there's some area of your spiritual life where you need to grow. Maybe there's a temptation or an addiction and you need to invite some people closer that can help you grow in these areas that you already want to grow in. And the third question, which might be the most important, is who do I need to invite to leave? Who do I need to invite to leave? And that, maybe that sounds a little harsh to you, that you would kick someone out of your table. And I don't at all want you to have this visual image in your mind of literally kicking someone out. That's not how we do it. We love people. But sometimes there needs to be some space between someone, some boundaries that are put in place because we've realized the effect that they're having on us is no longer positive. You know, throughout life, we tend to pick up relationships along the way. And sometimes people serve a purpose in our life for a season, but they're no longer serving a beneficial purpose in our life. And there just needs to be a little bit of separation, maybe a, a difficult conversation to say that you can't spend quite as much time with that person anymore because you don't want their influence on you to be taking you in a direction that God does not intend for you. So maybe right now we would just be reflective. God, what is it that you want me to do with my relationships? Who do I need to invite closer? Who do I need to put up some boundaries with? Who do you want seated at my table? So could we pray together and just offer this up to God? Father, we invite you in to our relationships. We know that you designed life to work in community. We're not lone rangers. We're not self-sufficient. We need one another. And so God, I pray for every person who is currently lonely, people that are sitting at a table all by themselves, trying to go at life alone. God, would you give them the eyes to see who they can invite to be a part of their community, how they can get more connected, and Father, I pray for wisdom, for people to discern who are the people that they need to keep close, keep listening to their advice, keep rowing in the same boat with those people. And who are the people that they need to create some boundaries with, some separation from? Or would you give us wisdom and discernment? Would you give us courage to make the right next step, to, to live our lives and to live within relationships? in a way that honors you. So we offer them to you, God. We, we just lay our relationships right before your throne and we ask you to speak to our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen.